There we go. Um, and also worth noting, we don't have that much time left in this class. Um, we are, it's the 12th today, right? So we're sitting right here at the end of week nine. Then we have week 10. Um, we did in, uh, IR spectroscopy, we covered that in lab, um, since it's a lab technique. Um, we will get to NMR and mass spectrometry after Thanksgiving. I think it makes makes a lot of sense to put those last two lab um, lab classes um, after Thanksgiving. And so next week we'll actually, we'll, like I said, we'll be spending most of our time on how do we determine um, which mechanism is most important if we have something that we're pretty sure is going to be either an elimination or substitution. What do, how do we know our major product? Um, and then we're done. So, um, and so we'll probably actually, I take it back, we'll cover NMR um, in lab next week so that we can actually do an NMR lab and still leave you guys a whole, uh, a whole lab period for the, your um, journal club, journal article presentations. Um, so over Thanksgiving, I'm going to try not to give you too much in terms of an assignment, although um, I don't know if you guys have been watching the numbers, but nobody should be going anywhere um, because I think we're about this close to being on full lockdown again. Um, if you look at how the uh, the COVID numbers are looking right now. Um, if you haven't seen this, this is a really interesting um, resource. I always get to it just by um, Googling Hopkins, John Hopkins COVID dashboard. Um, it's the it runs a little slow, but it's the the most detailed and uh, functional um, dashboard dashboard I've seen for tracking a lot of things because it allows you to break things down by um, what um, what region you're looking at. And so if you pick the US and give it a second to load. Um, these are the daily new cases for for the US, which is um, kind of crazy. You can see our the initial spike in the US and then we went into lockdown and everything slowed down. And then everybody got bored of being in lockdown and started going out and partying in the summer and traveling. Um, and you see a spike again, right when all of the restrictions relaxed in June and July. Um, and then everybody got serious about it again and then winter hit. Um, and winter makes upper respiratory infections way more likely because your sinuses are more and your lung tissue are more dried out. Therefore, they're more susceptible to infection. Um, and so in the last like two weeks, we have we've only had one or two days that were under 100,000 new cases in the US. Um, which means, and if you think about the numbers, we've got a total of like 10 million cases. 10% um, of that has happened in the last week and a half. Um, so we're still very much in the exponential growth portion of this. Um, and despite the fact, I'll end on a more positive note, um, we do have really good, really cool information about a new type of vaccine, not just a vaccine for COVID, but it's actually entirely new technology for making vaccines. Um, uh, actually, as long as we're here, we can look at California. Oh, California is finally not the number one state. Um, it was about to happen for a while. California's numbers are not nearly as bad. Um, we did have that summer spike, but we have not picked back up again like some of the northern states because it hasn't gotten as cold here yet. Um, and we have more humidity on the West Coast than they do in the Midwest. Um, so hopefully our in California, our winter won't be as bad as other places, but um, but this new style of vaccine is really promising um, in that it doesn't use, so traditionally what vaccines did is you took your virus and then you basically broke it up. You denatured most of it to the point where the proteins weren't dangerous anymore. And then you put it into a shot and allowed your immune system to sort of learn to recognize the various pieces of the proteins and that, that would um, allow you to to develop a way for your, your body basically learns to tag that virus when it comes in as being foreign and um, slows it down 
slows down its replication and and destroys it. Um, this new style of vaccine, though, they don't use the proteins um, from from the viruses and bacteria. They use they encode um, the the actual sequence of the proteins, the primary structure of the proteins into mRNA and inject your cells with mRNA. And mRNA, when it's in your cells, gets translated. They don't encode the entire viral DNA in mRNA, just chunks of it. So you still get non-functional proteins out of it. But it's something that your, your body will, it can produce more um, pieces of the, of the virus in your body and basically can speed up your body's ability to start recognizing it. And plus they can tailor, they don't even need an active sample of, of the virus to develop a vaccine. All they need is the, is the sequence of the virus's proteins. And they can actually just encode that as they, however they want. And that means that we can, we can adapt this, um, this style of making vaccines as fast as the virus mutates. The virus mutates, you, it could go as, to the point where you, they're releasing a new version, a new updated version, just like your software updating um, every month. Oh, did you get the October vaccine? Okay, well now you need to get the January vaccine. Um, the, way, the reason we don't traditionally do that is because if you, you can develop al allergies to vaccines themselves and some of the other material that we keep vaccines in, if you get too many vaccines. Um, and so with, this will basically eliminate that because your body won't develop an allergy to the to mRNA because that's a part of every single functioning cell has mRNA in it already. So it's a really a totally different approach that's gonna not just allow us to make a vaccine for COVID, but I think it's probably gonna change how we do vaccines period in the future. Um, because then you don't have to have samples of chicken pox on file to make a vaccine for chicken pox. You just need to have information in a computer digitally. That's pretty which cool. is kind of a really cool, cool concept and really cool idea. Um, and also worth noting on the, um, on the, I wouldn't call it the government or the politics front. Um, this is being developed by Pfizer. Um, who did not take any of the money from the federal government. Um, the, you know, the federal government threw literally a billion dollars at, at pharmaceutical companies trying to speed up the vaccine development. Pfizer is not one of the ones that took that money. Um, and so it just goes to show you can't legislate science. You can't just throw money at, or law at science and expect science to be able to jump through hoops for you. Um, it happened totally unexpectedly, not from one of the companies that was even was um, expected to come forward with the vaccine. And it's likely that they're going to be able to actually roll this out in the next month. They'll be able to actually start giving people that the vaccine, which means we still probably won't see it. Most people won't see it until the end of winter still. Um, but it does mean that we have a good shot of potentially being actually being in person in uh, spring quarter. Fingers crossed. All right, let's get into um, naming alkenes again. Um, this is where we left off the other day, right? And we said, okay, um, if we're gonna name an alkane, we're gonna follow all of our same rules. Find your longest continuous carbon chain, except now we're being, we're being really careful, just like with the halogens, it's gotta be our longest continuous carbon chain that has the alkene group in it. And then we're just going to use the prefix to, to, do, to name um, how many carbons there are. And then we just say alkene, we so be ethene instead of ethane, cyclohexene instead of cyclohexane. Um, and if it's on a longer chain where we need to specify where the double bond is, we just throw a one in front of the, the base molecule. Anytime you've, you've got your parent molecule, that has a number in front of it that's telling you where the the most important functional group for that parent molecule is. So one butene, um, we it wouldn't necessarily 
Uh, it doesn't mean you can't put more prefixes in front of it. So methyls, branches, halogens, we're still going to name those the same way as well. Um, just put, put more prefixes in front there. Um, so for example, if we wanted to If we wanted to name this molecule, start by finding your longest continuous carbon chain that has the alkene in it, which is the same in this case. All right, so we've got that makes it a pen teen. And our double bond is right in the middle, or sorry, right at the beginning. So it's one pentene. And then we just say, okay, well, we've got one pentene with a methyl group on the third carbon. So three methyl, one pentene, right? Almost entirely review. The only thing we're adding is now we can end in something besides ane. Um, that there are a few other characteristics of um, alkenes that that give us a new wrinkle. Um, the most in, I wouldn't, I guess I don't know if I'd say the most important, um, but the trickiest of which when it comes to naming is the fact that alkene bonds can't rotate freely like alkanes can. Those sigma bonds, though, they were just shaped mostly like a cylinder, right? And so there's nothing preventing it from, from things from rotating on either end. A pi bond, though, pi bond was above and below the sigma bond, right? If our pi bond is above and below the sigma bond, it's going to look something like, so if we have our, our carbon and our carbon, our sigma bond is going to look something like this. Right, where I, and I can shade that in, it's, but it's going to be basically a, a cloud that's kind of roughly cylinder shaped or egg shaped um, in between the two carbons, which means it can rotate without changing how much orbital overlap there is, right? Because it just looked like those two orbitals sitting on top of each other. The pi bonds were the ones that looked like those canoes or vampire teeth, depending on who you ask. They look like two pi, two p orbitals, those figure eights kind of smeared out um, so that they overlap a little bit. And what that means is that these are above and below the sigma bond. You can't rotate this bond anymore without breaking that because they only stick in, out in one dimension, right? They're not symmetrical all around. They're not rotationally symmetrical would be the mathematical way to say it. If you rotate this, these orbitals, you break the pi bond, which is doesn't generally happen at room temperature. At room temperature, things don't have enough energy to just break these pi bonds apart and reform them. So that means we have what's, what's basically called a, a hindered rotation, um, meaning that everything else can still rotate, but the pi bond can't. So that means that we actually, just like with our ring structures, where we could have cis and trans, because the ring was prohibited from rotating freely too, right? We couldn't rotate the ring structure on cyclohexane because we would have to break one of the sigma bonds to do that, right? We have the same thing that happens here. So we use similar nomenclature. We use um, the old school way of naming it was cis and trans. I um, mean, it means it's 
used the same way as in in um, ring structure. Cis means that the substituents are on the same side, and trans would mean that they're on opposite sides. Right. Um, the it gets a little bit confusing though to use cis and trans because cis and trans um, are referring to which direction the carbon chain is going. And so if you have something that, that's different than the primary carbon chain, it gets a little bit tricky. So, so the cis and trans for, for alkenes has sort of fallen out of favor um, and been replaced with a system that's really similar to R and S where we assign priority on both sides. And then we use that priority to determine, okay, they're on the same side or they're on opposite sides. Um, so the way we assign priority is the same as R and S. You just look at the atomic number. And if it's a tie, you go one more, one more bond out, right? So the priority system is, is really straightforward now that we've gotten used to R and S. Um, we don't say R and S, so we use E and Z. Um, which come from German. So R and S came from, from Latin. Um, e and Z come from the German and E stands for Intgegen, which means against, and Z stands for Zusammen. Um, something that sounds like the same, except with a Z in front of it. Um, Zusammen, which means the same side. So we could name these on, in either of these two systems, we'd call this one cis and this one trans. Um, if we were assigning priority, we would do the same thing on the one on the left. We'd say, okay, our higher priority out of the two substituents of on the left carbon, our higher priority would be the ethyl group. And on the right carbon, our higher priority would be the ethyl group. And our, and our lower priority would be the hydrogen. And since our higher priorities are on the same side, that would be the Z isomer. Zusammen means together in German. Thank you, Elke. I knew it was something like that. As there's enough, there's enough uh, cognates in German. Um, that uh, usually if it sounds like a word from English, it's probably pretty close. English took a lot of words from German. Um, if we look at the other one, we have our higher priority on each side are on opposite sides. They're not, we, they're pointed in opposite directions, um, which means this would be the E stereoisomer. Um, and the really, really cheesy, um, funny, I guess, dad joke sort of way of remembering um, which of these is which is, um, if you say it with a really bad French accent, Z is for the same side. Um, I actually, there is a textbook out there somewhere that actually recommends that. Um, I'm not going to say it too many more times because you guys should be able to remember that. Um, and this is really the more universal way of doing it, right? That cis and trans gets confusing because it's referring to the carbon chain itself, not to what's attached directly to the alkene. Um, and so if our longest carbon chain, like if we had a chlorine here instead of a hydrogen, Cis and trans would be referring to where the carbon chain goes, where E and Z is referring to the priority. So using that priority system is a little bit more universal. It applies to everything. And plus it matches with the fact that we've already practiced using it for R and S. Um, so I'm gonna stick mostly to using E and Z. Um, although I did, I was not, this is a new enough system that I was not taught E and Z when I was in college. When I was in college, I learned it just as cis and trans. So since I took OCHEM, which would have been 2006, um, this is system has become adopted and become widespread, the E and the Z system. Um, 
so you guys are you guys are cutting edge by adopting the E and the Z system. That at least for science, that's cutting edge. Sean, I got a question about that. Yeah. Was it? Did they just make it now? Like, why? Why was it not really needed before or used before then? Um, it's because before they so they just kind of made do with cis and trans, and you just had to know that you weren't referring to the atomic number; you were only used referring to um, the carbon chain. Um, and it's just sort of a like, well, we have a better way of doing that. We should probably switch to using the better way instead of just using the old way that everybody knows, um, which takes turnover, right? You you need old old OCHEM professors to retire before you can get new old OCHEM professors that will actually buy in. Um, so it's it, the system has probably actually been around since more like the the 50s and 60s. It's just finally made it into the textbooks in the last 20 years or so. And I had a really, really old OCHEM professor. So it could be that it was more widespread than, than in the, uh, than 2006, but I had an old professor. Um, when it comes to determining the priority for these, like I said, it's the exact same. If we look at this bottom example here, this bottom example, Hang on. Um, you're just looking at your atomic number for each side. And so the priority for these is not going to go one, two, three, four. Important to, to remember that. We're only looking at priority for each of the carbons that's a part of the alkene group is going to have a one and a two. And then so you have high priority on one side and then high priority on the other side. And then E and Z is just saying, are the two high priorities pointed the same direction or in opposite directions? Right, so not one, two, three, four, just one, two on each side. So for this example here, we've got bromine and hydrogen are the two things we're comparing for the left-hand side. Bromine is a higher atomic number than hydrogen. So bromine is the higher priority. On the other side, the, you've got carbon versus chlorine. Chlorine is the higher priority. So in this case, we wind up with both of the higher priority substituents pointed the same direction. So that would be our Z. Here, the bromine and the chlorine are pointed in opposite directions. So that'd be our E, okay? And again, just to reiterate, because it gets gets confusing, we're assigning priority for the what's attached to each carbon, right? So this, we do the left-hand side and then we do priority for the right-hand side. Or if it's not written that, that easily, <laughs> Let's go back to our example on the board here. And I'll just adapt this a little bit. So I didn't change that much. I just changed where the pi bond was. So it's no longer one pentene, it's two pentene. It still has a methyl group on carbon three. So then the question is, is this E or Z? So we have them, our higher priority on the other side, on the left-hand side, you've got a hydrogen there that's not drawn. So hydrogen versus a methyl, Methyl has higher priority. On this side, you've got a methyl versus an ethyl. So carbon, carbon, so tie. So take one more step and you got another carbon versus your next step here goes to a hydrogen. 
So your ethyl group is the higher priority on this side. So that means that they're on the same side of the pi bond. So that would make it the Z stereoisomer. All right, so looks really kind of familiar might not be the right word, but it looks similar to the way we've done other naming, right? Um, and we are going to have similar rules as well when it comes to determining if we need to use E and Z. Because we, if we were look, talking about R versus S, we could tell whether we needed to use R versus S um, if we had four different substituents on the same carbon, right? That was our our giveaway that made it an asymmetric center. If we if we have an alkene, we need two different things on each side of the alkene. So it doesn't mean you have to have four, four different substituents. Like for example, we had a methyl here and a methyl there. But what you do need is you need two things that are different on each side. In other words, you have to be able to assign priority, right? If you can't assign priority, if we had, if this was another methyl, now all of a sudden we can't assign priority here because we have CH3 and CH3. If you get this, if you have two identical substituents on one side of your alkene, there is no cis and trans, there is no E and Z. Because if you flipped those two, it'd be the exact same molecule, right? So instead of needing, we don't need four different substituents, but you need two different substituents on each side. Right, and so most, most commonly those two, if you wind up with two substituents that are the same, usually it's either hydrogens or methyls are the most common things where you'll have two identical substituents on one side, like this one. This is no longer Z, this would be just would be two, three dimethyl, two pentene. And you just wouldn't even have any year of Z. All right, so let's talk a little bit about mechanisms of these. We, we looked at these mechanisms before um, briefly, but now let's spend some time talking about these elimination reactions. So these are the, the mechanisms that make alkenes. Um, and so the, the concerted mechanism, which we're gonna call E2, for second order, just like SN2 was the concerted mechanism, um, where you had both things happening at once. You had your leaving group leave and your, your nucleophile attacks all at once. E2 is also going to be all happening all at once. Um, and so that you're going to have your base coming in and it's doing a nucleophilic attack, but it's doing a nucleophilic attack on a proton because this is a proton transfer step. So your base comes in, grabs the hydrogen, the electrons from the hydrogen, carbon hydrogen bond move over towards the carbon that has the leaving group um, to make the new pi bond. And then your leaving group is leaving all at the same time. All right, so this is, it's, similar in that it, it's, it's still just two of our mechanism steps happening at the same time. It's just a proton transfer step and a leaving group leaving happening at the same time. And the result is you wind up with your protonated base, your leaving group has left and brought its electrons with it and you make the alkene. So it's called an elimination reaction because we've we've eliminated molecules. 
they're no longer part of this carbon group, the organic molecule here. Um, substitution reactions, we were switching out one leaving group for a different nucleophile. Here, we're eliminating the leaving group, hence the name. Um, if it goes in steps, it, again, it's the same two steps. If you look at these arrows that are drawn on the step, stepwise mechanism, the E1 mechanism, this, the arrows are identical. We're just splitting it into two different steps. First thing that happens is your leaving group leaves and you get a carbocation intermediate. And then your base can come in here and grab the hydrogen and the electrons move over to make the alkene. All right, so similar, it's just like with SN1 versus SN2 though, we're gonna get, sometimes we're gonna get the same product. Not always though, because this stepwise, this concerted mechanism is gonna be a lot more limited in how it can happen. If everything has to happen all at once, everything has to be just right. So similar, just like we had to have the backside attack. So we only got one stereoisomer if it was SN2. Versus SN1, you could have rearrangement happening. You could have both stereoisomers, right? All of that was going to be dependent on the fact that you made this intermediate, which can now move around. This intermediate can move around. And that means your base can attack from more than one place, right? So just like before, E1 is going to give us a more complicated um set of products. E2 is more likely to just give us a single product. Um, also worth, so there's a, another descriptor that we'll use here. I keep using the term active carbon or the carbon with the leaving group. Um, that is generally referred to whatever the active carbon is, um, is frequently referred to as the alpha carbon. Just, and that means that, and then you basically number or you, you use Greek letters moving away from that active carbon to, so that you can really quickly identify. So I don't have to keep saying the carbon next door. It, it's referred to as the beta carbon. So the beta carbon is the carbon that loses the hydrogen. The alpha carbon is the carbon that loses the leaving group. And actually, I want to double check that because I'm thinking about, so for instance, if we have a, a ketone, If we had this molecule, this is referred to as an alpha beta on unsaturated ketone. So I'm actually thinking the active carbon is just the active carbon and alpha would be the carbon next to the active carbon in this case. So we'll hold our horses on using alpha and beta until I have a chance to double check that at break because um, I don't want to give you wrong information. Right. And I'll, we'll come back and I will reiterate what the correct way of doing that is after break. Um, so give me a second. Elimination reactions are a little bit more complicated than the substitution reactions because generally speaking, um, there's going to be more than one possible carbon that you could take hydrogens from. So if we were looking at, at this reaction happening here, there's only one possible product we could make, but if we think about it in terms of where are there hydrogens that can be attacked, either of these two carbons has a hydrogen that can be pulled off by the base, right? And so that in this case, that would give us the same product our mechanism, if it was if it was going E2, would look something like chlorine leaves with the electrons, the oxygen's coming in here and is going to grab 
a hydrogen and then the hydrogen carbon hydrogen bonds are going to move over to make a pi bond however I could have just as easily have drawn it grabbing one of those hydrogens, right? Which again, in this case, would not give us a different product. We'd get pentene, cyclopentene either way. But you can imagine if there was a methyl group on one part of on one side of the ring, we're going to get more than one possible product. Um, so I, when I wrote these slides, I was using beta as being the carbon next to the leaving group, carbon with the leaving group. Um, Pretty sure you're right, Sean, but I don't want to say that I think yet. so. Yeah. They use the alpha and the beta differently when it's ketones is what I think it is. It just gave me enough of a pause. I, wanted, I still want to double check. Um, but yeah, so the, the alpha carbon would be, the alpha and the beta carbons are the carbons that make the pi bond. The beta carbon is on losing a hydrogen. The alpha carbon is losing the leaving group. Um, if our beta carbons are identical, only one product is formed because it doesn't matter which beta carbon gets attacked. We're still going to make the same product. However, that's not always going to be the case. And so we wind up with, um, as we, as they were discovering these reactions, the, um, the various, the various scientists, and a lot of this was happening in Russia in the late 1800s. Um, and so they, they still didn't have a, a great understanding of quantum and how orbitals were working. Um, but there was a lot of good science that was happening there. So we get a lot of Russian names in our, in our organic chemistry. Um, and so they, they wind up seeing that if you have two different beta carbons, we wind up with two different products forming. So in this case, we have um, two methyl, two bromo butane going through this reaction. Your bromine leaves which means your base can then pull a hydrogen off of any of the beta carbons. I've finally gotten good at writing English characters with, with the mouse, but Greek letters are still tricky. Too many curvy lines in Greek letters. Um, so depending on which carbon gets attacked by the base, we're going to get different products. And it's not going to be, if everything was identical, if our products were identical in stability, we would expect this to maybe be driven by statistics, probability. There's six possible hydrogens that can be grabbed if you grab one of the beta carbons on the left. And there's, there are only two possible, let me correct my, or switch to a different color. There are only two hydrogens on the beta carbon on the right. So if we, if it was just a matter of what's the probability that your base runs into one of these, we would expect the, these two red beta carbons will both give us the product on the, on the right hand side. So, but we actually see less of that forms. This product that we get from the right-hand beta carbon is the major product, but there were only two possible hydrogens to grab there. So it must be more complicated than just the probability, right? There's, for some reason, it must be easier to grab the hydrogens attached here, or we're making a product that's way more stable, right? Because it also wouldn't make sense to think about it in terms of how easy it was to get to the hydrogen, because there's more stuff getting in the way of this beta carbon, right? This beta carbon's on a secondary carbon, which means it would be harder for the base to actually get in there and grab those. 
because you've got more other stuff in the way. So it can't be just having access to it. It can't be the sterics and it can't be just raw probability because those would both predict that we'd make the red product more. So it must be something about the alkene being more stable that allows, that allows us to, to observe these ratios. So when it comes to what factors affect alkene stability, it's going to be a lot like what affects carbocation stability. Carbocation stability was governed by how many other carbons were around it, right? The more carbons you had around a carbocation, the more stable it was, right? Because you had all that electron density that could kind of donate some electrons there. When we look at alkenes, we get a similar rule, which I'm double check my slides. Um, the rule for alkene stability is that you will always, most of the time, your major product will be the more substituted alkene. So I'll say that again, the more substituted alkene is more stable. And so it's, and it must go beyond sterics because it's not just a matter of of being too crowded, the more substituted alkene is going to be the product most of the time. Right. Um, and that is known as Zaitsev's rule. I told you we're going to get into a lot of Russian names. Um, Zaitsev was a was a uh, chemist who studied, he was, he actually had a really big rivalry. There's something about these Russian chemists from the 1800s, like Mendeleev, nobody really liked each other. They were all kind of just dicks to each other. Maybe it was a toxic environment, you know. Um, but uh, Zaitsev actually had a really intense rivalry with the, with the other researchers in his own research group. Um, that to the point where he let one of his co co-workers publish the first part of a three-part of a three-part uh, series um, before he came out, he had his results, and he let his his uh, co-worker publish the first part of his series before he came up and published his results that said, "No, no, no, that guy's all wrong." Like they were literally working next door to each other. They could have he could have just said. Are you sure you want to publish that? Maybe we should we should work on this for a second. No, he let him publish first, and then immediately following that said, "Yeah, remember the rest of that three part series? You're not going to get to publish that." Um, so they're very the politics of these uh, these Russian chemists are are fascinating. If you if you've ever worked in a in a uh, environment where you have to deal with somebody like that who will let you do something wrong just so that they can pointed out to the boss, basically. Um, that's, that's their attitude here. Nobody likes those guys. Or gals. Girls can be mean too. All right, let's go ahead and take a break and we'll come back and we'll practice with these. And so I'll give you guys a few minutes to practice these on your own um, before I start working through the, the um, answers with you. So I will start going through the problems at nine. Um, and uh, you guys give yourselves a few minutes, get back a few minutes before nine to work on these or do them right now. And then we'll, we'll go through them together.
So Zaitsev's story gets better. Uh, I was reading about it. Um, so the guy that he allowed to publish and then published a direct refutation of his coworker um, tried to stop the guy that, so Zaitsev's colleague, whose name is Markovnikov, and that, that name will come up again in a few minutes. Markovnikov has his own rule um, that comes up in a chapter or two. Um, Markovnikov actually tried to prevent Zaitsev from getting a job at the university and tried, he, um, he objected to him becoming a professor at that university um, and uh, was not very happy when, when um, Zaitsev got the job anyway. So that kind of started the whole, um, the whole rivalry. And it actually probably went back further than that because they were actually, before they were professors together, they were students together. Um, working under the same chemist whose name was Butlerov. Um, and uh, for some reason, he left Butlerov's, Zaitsev left Butlerov's lab to go study chemistry in Germany instead of finishing up in Butlerov's lab. And then he came back to Russia after he got his PhD in Germany to try and work at the university. And so Markovnikov probably just didn't think he was a very good chemist, which is why he had to leave to go finish his work in, in Germany because they thought German, German chemists were inferior to Russian chemists. Um, so, and you can see that actually in the, in the requirements. If, if you were rush, if you got a master's in chemistry from a Russian university, um, you could teach, you could be a professor. But if, you, if it came from any foreign university like Germany, you had to have a PhD. Um, and so they, they very explicitly valued Russian scientists as being better than foreign scientists. And so that's probably why Markovnikov tried to fight Zaitsev getting the job in the first place. And then, so then Zaitsev let, let Markovnikov, you know, put his, put his uh, foot in his own mouth um, by publishing and then immediately turning around and, and telling everybody that oh, Markovnikov doesn't know what he's doing. So anyway, it's just, the backstory is always fascinating to me because I've worked in environments like that before. Um, when it comes to actually predicting these reactions, let me get mole view pulled up. Um, if it's drawn in condensed structure, it's not always as immediately obvious what's going to happen. So sometimes it can be advantageous to start by drawing things in skeletal structure. So we have bromo, two bromo butane. We put it with a strong base like hydroxide. Our product is going to be so we're going to break that bond we're going to remove a hydrogen from one of the two beta carbons and so we could make we could make the the more substituted product or the less substituted product which would look like that and in the case that we have more than one possible um, stereoisomer, we made, I drew it initially as the trans form, as the E stereoisomer, but there's a Z stereoisomer here as well, right? That's also two butene, right? So we, depending on which of the two protons get grabbed, what the configuration is when, when that proton is removed, it'll get locked into either the cis or the trans configuration, the E or the Z configuration. So we will, we will actually wind up with a mixture of all of these for this elimination reaction. 
these, the more substituted stereo or the more substituted products will be favored. The major product will be these two, some combination of these two. Whether it's going to be exactly 50 50 out of these or whether it's going to be favoring either the cis or the trans will depend a little bit on the exact configuration and sterics basically which of these would we expect to be more stable based on sterics or sterics means just the physical amount of space you have the top one yeah the 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 e configuration puts the two big methyl groups away from each other so they're not pushing on each other they're pushing on each other a little bit here they're not that close to each other but there's enough of a of a uh, interaction between these two that our major product would probably be the more substituted um, would be the more substituted alkene that puts the biggest groups in the E configuration. So how about for number two? So our group to start is going to look, I'll try to draw the angles more like the way it's drawn on the slide right now. Our starting material looks like this. This is our reactant, right? One carbon, two carbon, three carbons, four carbons. So butane with a methyl group on the same carbon that has our leaving group on the alpha carbon. So then our elimination product would be, so the mechanism would look something like chlorine leaves one of those hydrogens from the beta, from a beta carbon is attacked by hydroxide and the electrons from the carbon hydrogen bond move over to fill the gap that's left when the leaving group leaves it looks a little bit messy i don't like using zoom's annotations don't don't work as well as the uh, powerpoint ones um so our products our potential products would be anything where we've removed the chlorine and then that same carbon we could have a pi bond there or there or those would be the three beta carbons right one two and three are two of these identical though these both give us the same these are both the same product right so the two identical methyl groups that we had to pull um to pull hydrogens from this is why why the rules if there is more than one type of beta carbon these two methyl groups that we started with over here those are identical so it doesn't matter which of them we pull a proton from we're going to make the same product we, in Shana. either case we wind up with one or two methyl one butene So I have a quick question about that. Yeah. Uh, is that uh, in the book? Is that what they refer to as the minor? There was a maiden. Exactly. Like maiden and my, okay. So then is that just because they're, it's considered minor because there are multiple 
Like, why is it considered minor? So minor, major, the major product is what you make the most of. Okay. And so the minor product is anything that you make, but not in, not make the most of it. So if you may, if, if we have these three possibilities, okay. when we look at the stoichiometry, we find out that 50% of our product turns into this. And actually that's, sorry, um, 60% turns into this and then 40% turns into this. These would be the, this would be the minor product just because we make less of it. Okay, so even though there's a possibility of them going to those two more, like since they're different, is that wrong to think of it like that? Like since there are different versions of it? So let me, if we go up to the ones at the top, we, we decided that we had, we could rank these basically one, two to three across <laughs> on the top one. Yep. That would make this, the one on the left would be the major product. This would be a minor product. These, both of these others would be minor products. Okay. Okay. Right. So there's all, if you wind up with it where your major product has two different stereoisomers and they're going to be exactly the same, like odds wise, like R versus S, yep. if, um, then we would say that we could say that there were two major products because it's going to be they're they're both just as likely but usually you're going to have one major product and then you can have one or several minor products um, and there are a couple reactions out there um, that that basically only make a single product like sn2 reactions you're not going to get a mixture of products for if it goes fully sn2 because it will only go through that one mechanism Okay, cool. Thanks. No problem. Thanks for, for bringing that up. Good to clarify. So for the second one, our major product would be the more substituted alkene. And then our minor product would be the less substituted alkene. Do we have more than one stereoisomer for the major product? We get a, an E and a Z. These two methyls are identical, right? Which means you couldn't assign priority. If you switched them, it'd be the same molecule. So no stereoisomer in this case, we get just two products. And neither of these has a stereoisomer, right? Is this one, you've got a methyl group versus an ethyl on the left-hand side, but then you have two hydrogens on the right-hand side. So again, two identical substituents, you can't decide which of the hydrogens is more important. Um, if the bromine, if we started from methyl, methyl butane again, but the bromine was adjacent to the methyl group, instead of being on the same carbon, so if this is our starting material, what product are we going to get? the same one right the major product is going to be the same because the two beta carbons we have to choose from one of them will give us let's this is our major product that's our more substituted alkene we could make right we'd be taking the hydrogen from this carbon which means we made the same thing. The other option, the minor product will look a little bit different. The minor product now would look like that. And so to be consistent, I'll switch. So our major product, once again, is the more, most substituted alkene that we can make. And the minor product would be the less substituted. Right, so in 
this case, the minor product winds up being different, but the major product is the same. Um, and this is, it's actually a, an interesting point that when you hear, if you hear news stories or read articles where they talk about doing things like um, trying to identify where, you know, where some drug lab is based on what, what are the trace product or the other traces that are mixed in with the, with the stuff they're selling. Um, this is one of the th ways they can do that because the major product in this case would be the same but you can actually tell what the starting material is if you look at the minor product. And if you know what the starting material is, that can narrow down where somebody was when they made that. And that's, you can do same thing with things like gasoline. You can tell where gasoline comes from, what, what petroleum refinery made the gasoline by looking at what are the minor products in the, mixed in with the gasoline, because it's this, even if it's almost all the same stuff, the little trace amounts of, of impurities um, will frequently have clues in there. Um, you know, the amount of um, sulfur that is or isn't present in gasoline will tell you whether, you know, how much of the refinery was built using copper, for instance, because copper removes sulfur. Um, if, you, you, if you have copper present in a distillation, it removes sulfur, sulfur compounds. Um, it'll also, you can also tell where in the world the, the crude petroleum came from based on some of the, you know, tra trace elements there. Um, so it's, the minor products are usually, if, if you're from the point of view of a synthetic chemist, somebody who's trying to make a specific compound, the minor products, we don't generally care about them. We just care about keeping them as small as possible. But from the point of view of trying to figure out to reverse engineer something, the minor products can be really, really helpful in determining where you started. Um, forensic chemistry is actually a really fascinating field for just for reasons like that, because it's um, trying to work backwards from an end product a lot of the time. A lot of it is really, really boring. Um, if you want to get an idea of um, what's involved in forensic chemistry. There was actually a good um, Netflix documentary series, like did one of those uh, six episode mini series on Netflix. Um, I think it's called Fixing a Drug Scandal or something like that, um, about the forensic chemists in uh, Massachusetts, I believe. Um, in Mass the state of Massachusetts only has two forensic chemistry labs and forensic chemists are responsible for Anytime somebody's arrested with drugs, they're basically tasked with saying, okay, yes, it's this drug. Here's how much it is. It's this drug. It's this purity. Um, and on the West hand side of the state, there was one chemist who was working all by herself a lot, um, who developed a drug problem and just started stealing samples um, as she was testing them. And then simultaneously, there was someone on the East side of the state in the other forensic chemistry lab who was being way too productive. Um, and that was because she wasn't actually running the test. She would just look at a powder and like, ah, that's cocaine, sure, sign off. I did the test, it's cocaine. Um, and th this happened simultaneously. And so they had something like 10,000 convictions that had to be re-examined or thrown out um, because these two, these two women um, just went off the rails. Um, when it came to doing their job as friends at chemists. Um, but it is mind numbingly boring most of the times. So take take a 0.1 gra gram sample of the alleged cocaine, test it, does it turn this color? Okay, Does test it again, does it turn that color? Okay, sign off on it saying that you did the test and it's cocaine. Move on to the next one. And you just do that over and over and over and over. Um, those 10,000 cases was like two years worth of data was all it was. And so that's how many, how many samples they were going through. Anyway, um, fixing a drug scandal is, it was highly, highly entertaining, looked at the human element as well as some of the, the OCHEM that goes into this as well of uh, being a forensic chemist. All right. Now that we've gotten the hang of Zaitsev's rule, I'm going to show you the exceptions to Zaitsev's rule. Um, the exceptions to Zaitsev's rule 
So the Zaitsev's rule is that you make the more substituted alkene is favored, is the major product. However, if you use what's called a sterically hindered base, if you use a base that's physically large, it can't always get to that, to the carbon in the middle of the molecule that would give you the more substituted product. So if you have a sterically hindered base and and ter potassium tert-butoxide or TBOK um, is the way it's usually written. TBOK um, or triethylamine are the most common bases that are used for this. Um, what that's going to do is basically, instead of making the Zaitsev product as your major product, you make what's called the Hoffman product. Um, and the Hoffman product, this also goes back to that German, German Russian rivalry. Hoffman was German. Um, Zaitsev was Russian, but he got his PhD with Germans. Markovnikov, the one who got his, his results directly refuted by Zaitsev, was full Russian and didn't bother reading German um, research because he didn't think it was good. Um, and that's one of the reasons why he published bad data. Um, the Hoffman product. Um, is going to be the less substituted product. So the, the larger the base is, the more we're going to favor making the Hoffman product. So if we just use, if we use hydroxide or ethoxide as our base, we're going to make 70 plus percent of our product is going to be the Zaitsev product, the most substituted product. If our base is larger, like TBOK, or this would be uh, tetraethyl, I don't even sure how we would name that. I'd have to look the name up for that one. Um, but basically, the bigger you get on your base, the more other steric stuff you have happening around um, your, your base, the more you're going to favor the Hoffman product. Right. So when it comes to, you know, I'm not going to ask you guys to memorize these percentages or predict these percentages necessarily. Um, but just to remember, if your base is big and bulky, and the most common of them is TBOK, it just switches that Zaitsev's rule. You get the Hoffman product instead of the Zaitsev product as your major product. Which all of a sudden that gives us a lot of of power when it comes to designing these reaction patterns. Um, if we're trying to make a specific compound and we want the double bond in the middle of the molecule versus at the end of the molecule, switching which base you use is what's gonna allow you to, to do that. Okay, if I wanna put, if I want it to be a terminal alkene, a terminal alkene would be something where you've got your pi bond is at the end of the carbon chain you basically have to use a sterically hindered base. Otherwise, there's no way that your elimination reaction will, will give you a terminal alkene because it's always going to be more substituted. So if you want the Hoffman product, you have to use the sterically hindered base. Thank you. And this we already talked about a little bit as well. If we have an E2 reaction, in addition to being regioselective, so regioselective means that we're putting, putting the alkene in a specific region of the molecule. We're making the more substituted alkene versus the less substituted alkene. They're also stereoselective, meaning that you're going to favor one stereoisomer over the other. So for instance, if we have three bromo pentane and it goes through an elimination reaction, we could make the E product or the Z product. But we're going to favor making making the um, product where that puts the larger groups apart from each other. 
Sterix has a lot to do with OCHEM, especially this reaction. We're going to try and keep those larger groups away from each other. Um, and which product would you make? Major, major product. I think I had a white box over these before um, that disappeared because it already is labeled for you, right? Um, the limits to this, to these rules, are when you don't have enough protons around. If you have a carbon that doesn't have any protons, then you can't pull a proton off of it. Right, so we do still need to be able to count to four and remember how many and find where the hydrogens are. Because, for instance, if I look at, let's do a similar reaction on the board here. If we have 3,3-dimethyl-2-bromobutane and it goes through an elimination reaction, move it over. And so it's going to go through an E2 reaction. It doesn't matter what base I use in this case, because there's only one beta carbon that I can actually make an elimination reaction with, right? This carbon doesn't have any hydrogens on it. Therefore, it can't be, you can't make an alkene here. You'd have to actually break off one of the methyl groups and carbon carbon bonds are too stable for that your base is not strong enough to pull off a carbon-carbon bond. Very few things are actually gonna break a carbon-carbon bond. So that means that in this case, we're limited to only making one product. Regardless of what the base is, there is no way to make the more substituted product. All right, so we're still going to be limited that way. Let me go back to the slides here. Um, so just to remind you, we do need to still pay attention to that. And occasionally, we wind up with E2 reactions that aren't just stereoselective. It means stereoselective means that we favor one stereoisomer over the other. Occasionally, they're actually stereospecific, which means that you don't get a mixture of the two possibilities favoring one over the other. You only get one stereoisomer. So that's like your SN2 reactions. SN2 reactions, if you started with one stereoisomer, you only got one stereoisomer as your product, right? Because it went through that umbrella flip. Sometimes E2 reactions can be stereospecific as well, especially if your beta carbons only has one possible hydrogen. So this is actually the more complicated cases when there's just one possible hydrogen. So look at let's look at what's being drawn here and fix this a little bit and make it larger. What's going on here is if we have, so pH, I knew that there was another shorthand um, that I forgot to tell you guys. ME is methyl, ET is ethyl, pH is a, is a benzene ring, is a phenyl group. Um, so pH is a benzene ring, there's our methyl. We only have one hydrogen on this beta carbon and the beta carbon on the other side doesn't have any hydrogens. Right, so we only have one possibility here. And 
we're only going to make one product because our two options here, there's, we could make the, the cis or the trans in theory, but if we have our hydrogen pointed away from everything else and our bromine over here, our, our mechanism would look something like this, then your beta carbon electrons move over to make the pi bond, which means, and then your base has to be over here, whatever your base is, has to have a lone pair, is gonna come in and grab the hydrogen, right? There's only one possible configuration that you can get here, right? Because there's only one choice for hydrogen to grab. So in this case, what we would actually wind up getting as a product I'll redraw this on my board here and zoom in a little bit. When this gets, when we go through this mechanism, base comes in here, grabs, these move over, leaving group leaves. The product that we're going to get in this case is going to be, is going to have the benzene ring, the phenyl group going one direction, the methyl going the other direction. Then on the other side, the methyl and the T-butyl group were pointed in the same direction when this happened, right? If the reaction is all happening in the flat plane of the board, you get your T-butyl group on opposite side of the hydrogen that's still left. And your T-butyl group and your methyl are both happening behind, are both behind the reaction. And your phenyl group and your hydrogen are both in front of the reaction. So when this all happens and turns into a planar molecule, we get this, which if we wanted to draw the whole thing would be fairly, fairly convoluted, which is why we use these, these abbreviations sometimes. We have something that looks like benzene ring, methyl, t-butyl group. That would be our final molecule in this case. That's just interpreting this and drawing it in the skeletal structure. Well, so that, that would be one of the possibilities if this was rotated, if I took this whole thing and rotated it to start before the reaction happened, what would we be looking at? I'm just going to take the, um, the left-hand carbon and spin it around like a fan blade. So put the, I'm going to put the hydrogen up. And that would put the methyl would then be coming out towards us down here. The phenyl would be going backwards. And if all of this is still possibly, or is still rotating around, this is a possibility, right? So, but what would have to happen is we'd still need our bromine to leave. We'd still need these electrons to move over. 
we'd still need our base coming in here, grabbing the hydrogen. Our leaving groups are typically big, bulky groups that take up a lot of space. This is basically the same question about backside attack from SN2. This is not going to happen because you're not going to have your base coming in from the same side as your leaving group is leaving. Because physically, there's just not enough space. So that, what that means is you have to have your hydrogen has to be 180 degrees, basically, from your leaving group. So only the first option is a possibility because we need that hydrogen to be um, in the opposite direction, which has its own term Um, and so that the the term for that is um, coplanar. You need your your hydrogen has to be in the same plane as your bromine. It has to be they have to be flat in order for all the orbitals to overlap the way they need to to break and form these bonds. You have to have them be coplanar. And specifically, we want them to be they have to be coplanar where your hydrogen and your bromine are anti relative to each other. Anti just means opposite. So you may have noticed that that organic chemists have about seven different ways of saying opposite. Um, you've got trans, you've got E, you've got anti. Um, but we use them to describe different things because the E and trans are referring to the structure of the compound. Anti is specifically referring to a specific conformer of that compound. Um, and then I believe the, if you actually, if you read the book, the, um, they actually further specify that, well, it doesn't technically have to be exactly coplanar. Um, some some mathematician must have gotten involved somewhere and said, well, it can happen when they're 178 degrees, so they're not coplanar. Um, and so the chemists in response said, well, we're just going to make up a new word then. We're going to call it, we're going to call it periplanar. Periplanar means almost coplanar. Like coplanar enough for sig figs, basically. Um, so if you see periplanar, that's what it's referring to. And it's just because mathematicians have had to be mathematicians well, well actually so um let's do a few more practice and we'll continue on here if we're talking about e2 specifically that's a, an advantage to being talking about e2 because it means that we don't need to worry about rearrangement E1 is actually is if you can pay attention to rearrangement, E1 is a little bit easier because you don't need to worry as much about being anti periplanar or anything like that because you're it's happening in more than one step. If it's all happening, if it if it's ha all happening in one step, that means we have to be very, very specific with things. And so that means we have to be we're going to have fewer products, but we have to be more careful about them. So for this first reaction, our base is methoxide, which is not a sterically hindered base. We have a couple of different beta carbons. The two red ones are identical to each other. The other beta carbon would be the methyl group which would give us a different product. So our possible products here are this would be 
one methyl cyclohexene. Or we could have the pi bond going to the methyl group. That'd be our other product that we get from taking away the protons from the blue beta carbon. And the one we would expect to make the most would be the more substituted one. I'll use, use some music notation here. In music notation, capital M means major, lowercase m means minor. Save, save you some time on those. I'll accept that. We have two methyl, two iodo pentane with T butoxide. Which again, was a sterically hindered base. So our two possible are more substituted um, beta carbon or alkene would come from the red beta carbon and our less substituted alkene would come from deprotonating the blue beta carbons here. And the fact that it's a sterically hindered base, so we let's draw both products first. There's our more substituted product. There's our less substituted product. Both of the two methyl groups are identical, right? So they will both give us the same product, which is what we see here. This We could draw the, the pi bond going to the top methyl group, but it'd be the same product either way, right? If I drew it. like that, these are the same thing. You can make them look the same just by rotating around that bond and it would spin around and you'd put your pi bond up and your methyl group over. So if we're trying to determine which of these is the major and the minor product, because it's a sterically hindered base, we get the Hoffman product, not the Zaitsev product. We get the, we, this is our exception, basically. This inverts our rule. Zaitsev's rule says we make the more substituted alkene. If it's sterically hindered, it, that gets flipped on its head. So our major product and our minor product. Let's look at this last one. This one's complicated looking, right? There's a lot of stuff going on. And when there's a lot of stuff going on, that should be a red flag that you should be paying attention to where are the hydrogens I can actually take off and how many of them are there. All right, so we have a beta carbon over here that has no hydrogens on it. So our only beta carbon then is on this side. And does it have more than one proton? As long as it has more than one proton that can be pulled off, 
then that means we're going to get both possible stereoisomers. We might favor one stereoisomer over the other based on the sterics. But if there are two possibilities, and I'm, I'm going to come back to this slide in a second, so don't panic. As long as there are two possible hydrogens, then we can still get both the E and the Z form. We might favor one of them over the other based on sterics, but we only have to worry about getting, it, it's only going to be stereo specific if there's only one proton to remove, right? That's what made this one so weird that we only got one specific stereoisomer was the fact we only had one hydrogen. If you have two hydrogens, then things then things could be in different com, um, configurations, which means you could get the E or the Z, right? So the fact that this bottom compound has two hydrogens means that things can be in the E or the Z. We're going to favor making one of them specifically. And we can see which one will favor um, by looking at these sterics, which are generally going to be, you're just going to put the biggest groups on opposite sides from each other. So our product here then becomes Got our benzene ring, got our carbon. That was our beta carbon. There's our new pi bond. And our T-butyl group is going to be in the opposite direction as our phenyl group. So those are both big, bulky groups that take up a lot of space. So they're going to tend to arrange themselves to be on opposite sides. And we can actually look at, if you look at the Newman projection of this compound, I know you guys are probably hoping to be done with Newman projections, but it's helpful here because if we look at the Newman projection right here, we get something that shows exactly what the shape everything will be in when it becomes more stable. So if you start with, If we're drawing from the carbon that has the benzene attached as the front carbon. And let's draw, we'll draw our benzene up. And then we had two hydrogens. Then on the rear carbon, we have a bromine. This is before the elimination reaction. A bromine going to the left. The T-butyl group is straight down, and then a hydrogen right there. We have to have these things in an eclipsed configuration, or sorry, in um, we have to have the bromine has to be opposite, has to be anti relative to the hydrogen that's being removed, right? So if we do that, if our bromine is opposite of the hydrogen, if this hydrogen is removed and the bromine is removed, when everything flattens out, you wind up with your phenyl pointed up and your T-butyl pointed down. If it was the other hydrogen that was being removed, we would have to rotate everything on the front. And then we wind up with our benzene ring down there. This could still happen, and this would give you the, the Z product. But look, you've got three really big groups right in a row, right? And we know from learning about Newman projections, that's unfavorable. We wanted our Newman projections to be most stable when we didn't have our big bulky groups right next to each other. So most of the time, the conformer that we'll actually see our, our reactant in would look like this. 
which means when this goes through in an elimination reaction, the bromine is taking its electrons, the base is coming in here and grabbing the hydrogen, and these electrons are moving to the carbon that's eclipsed in the back. And then that means everything that's left is just going to flatten out. So it's, it's not like our rules for stability go out the window that we don't have to consider them anymore. The simpler way usually of thinking about this is there are the, the result of this is just going to be that your product has the bulky groups on opposite sides too because the more stable conformer that reacted had the bulky groups on opposite sides. So our other product would be I, I've had better benzenes, but we'll we'll just keep going. That would be our other product here. where we have the two the two groups on the same side the z product but the major product is going to be the one that has them trans relative to each other where it puts them in the e configuration All right, how are we doing on that? Sean, is, do you get the two separate, separate forms because it rearranged after the reaction? Or are you more so talking about uh, your base attacking the different hydrogens? There, there are two possible hydrogens that can be attacked. And so in the conformer that you have to be in for, the, for that reaction to happen, is going to dictate which of the products you make. So it's not going to rearrange after the product. This all has to happen at once. And once you make these products, we can't switch back and forth between them. So it's the fact that we that before the reaction happens, this conformer, when we think about it in, in, as a Newman projection, this can rotate into different shapes. And any of the conformers that put a put a hydrogen in the anti configuration from your leaving group are valid, but we're not good. They're not equally valid because they're going to be governed by our rules for stability, which say keep big things apart from each other. So this is a possibility, as is the other possibility would be. Putting our benzene down into the left, if I leave everything else where it is. Right, that, that is the other possible reactive form. But because that puts our bromine, our benzene, and our T-butyl group all right next to each other, this is just going to happen. Both of these are happening with our reactants at all times, but this maybe only like 10% of it is gonna be in this conformer at any given time. And 90% of it is gonna look like this because that keeps our benzene ring away from being stuck between these two big groups. So they could, either one of these is possible for, in our reactants and either one of them would react in an E2 mechanism because they both have a hydrogen that's opposite from your bromine. But the fact that 90% of our molecules are gonna be like this at any given time means that this is gonna give us our more favorable product. This is our more likely product. I'm trying to think of a, of a, good, a good analogy. Um, 
it it's a bit like I don't know if you if you look at what room people are in in your in your house or your apartment at any given time. Um, if and then said, okay, there's a there's a possibility that at some point in the next in the next hour, um, the power is going to go out. Where is everybody when the power goes out? Well, they're most likely to be wherever they're normally most likely to be, right? They're still going to, if you're just going about your day, there's a problem. The likelihood is that you're going to be in your main living space when the power goes out. There's a one in one in uh, three chance that you're sleeping when the power goes out and you're in your bedroom, right? But two thirds of the time you're in the main living room. So, and that's kind of what we have here. This is our more stable case. So this is like being in your main living space, but there is a possibility that this happens, that when the reaction happens, it happens to be in this less stable complement. And that's what's gonna give you your, your E configuration. Oh, and we are well over time at this point. Um, so we'll go ahead and stop there. And we'll have a quiz this week. Um, so check the quiz later today after I get it written. It'll be some practice with this stuff. Um, if I do have it, if it is set up as those essays, as the essay form, remember you can embed the pictures that way. Um, I'll try to make sure I remember to keep those as um, file uploads um, since you guys are all used to that. Um, and we'll just go from there. Any questions?